Sonny is a serial entrepreneur and leader. He's led, uh, he's been a leader in the work. Oh, sorry. That's all right. In the work at the Port Authority, which is so important to the economy of Georgia, to, to enlarge the port in Savannah, to bring raw materials in from around the world and to ship product made in the United States out to around the world. So the Port Authority is very important. Sonny's been a leader in business. I don't know how many businesses, but a lot. And he's been a leader in the community. And those kinds of people are important. Because that what, that's what makes Atlanta a great city, is we have people who are willing to become involved. Sometimes it takes going home a little bit later in the evening, or coming in a little bit earlier in the morning. But that's the price you pay to contribute to the city. And as a citizen, of this city, it should be your obligation to participate. Now, let me talk a minute about leaders because sometimes it gets carried away. Everybody doesn't have to be a leader. In fact, if everybody was a leader, there'd be no followers, there'd be nobody to lead, and the whole thing would break down. There needs to be good followers. But good followers need to also know the skills that are required to be a good leader so that they can evaluate leaders that try to involve them in whatever program they're involved in. And so it's good to know what's happening in the leadership world, whatever your goal may be. Maybe you're not the kind of person that wants to step up front. Maybe you're not the kind of person that wants to form a committee or raise money or do those things that are done. But even if you're not, you need to be able to identify credible, ethical, real leaders. Leadership is, I'm going to talk about leaders for a minute. Leaders, leadership is a key component in the character of women or men who choose to do that, who choose to take those responsibilities. Leaders are made, not born. If you want to be a leader, you got to go to school. you got to get some, some background and some knowledge. Talk a little bit about how to do that. Leadership is an acquired skill. What you're doing by participating in these classes is acquiring the skills necessary to determine what you might want to be involved in as a leader in this community. Leadership's like a muscle. It's like a muscle. If you don't work it, if you don't lift those weights, if you don't get that experience, if you don't run those steps or run those sprints, you don't acquire the leadership skills that you need. And so it's a place where you ought to be. It's a place where you ought to spend some of your education time. Leadership opportunities exist in the for-profit and the not-for-profit community. But they're different. And we'll talk a little bit about those differences. United States has always been known as a place where leadership has a chance. You don't have to go through so, so many committees. You don't have to be born to silver spoon in your mouth. You can, if you want to, try yourself, succeed yourself, or you can choose not to. If you choose to, you become an important member of the community. During the Revolutionary War, <coughs> Baron de Tocqueville came from France to assist General Washington in putting his, ar his armor, his army in shape to battle uh, the English. But de Tocqueville was amazed at the society in the United States. What amazed him is that if a farmer's barn burned down, the whole community came together to help rebuild it. If a, far if a family had ill children, needed to take them to the hospital. The whole neighborhood came together to provide food and, and care. That was very unusual, not the way things are done in Europe. Europe is much more structured. The Tocqueville was so impressed that he wrote a book on leadership and on charity. And both of those subjects, that book has become the Bible, really, 
of those subjects because he saw it from a new set of eyes and he was so impressed that he went back in Europe. I don't think Europe changed a lot, but the United States has continued to be that kind of operation. I thought maybe the best way for us to do this this morning would be for me to tell you a little bit about some of the things that I've done, not because they're all successful and not because they all were winners, but because they all were teaching opportunities. Uh, and remember that this is not a presentation. This is a conversation. So if you have a question or you don't agree with something I said or you'd like to expand on it, you'll raise your hand. We can do that. We can stop. We can change direction. But I'm here and I'm willing to spend the time with you to try to accomplish the task that, uh, that Sonny has has given to us. My first leadership experience was as the president of the Junior Civitan Club at Sylvan High School a long time ago, back when the earth was cooling. <laughs> when horses pulled everything. Uh, I was pretty impressed with myself when I was elected to that job. And what the Junior Civitan Club did is during the holiday season every year, they sold Claxton fruitcakes to raise money for their projects. Well, as the new president, I thought we ought to sell more fruitcakes than anybody any club ever had, so I uh, announced the goal. And we began to sell Claxton fruitcakes. I noticed that the numbers were not going up sky high. I noticed I was selling most of the fruitcakes. And one cold Saturday afternoon when I found myself standing on the corner at Auburn Avenue selling Claxton fruitcakes, I realized that I was a leader, but I didn't have any followers. So that was the first lesson for me in leadership. I had established a goal, but the team members weren't in on the goal. They weren't committed to the goal. And so they were perfectly happy to let me be the best Claxton fruitcake salesman that ever existed. And I was a pretty good one because we did barely squeak in to be the highest selling club, but it was a lot of work for me and I'm not sure my grades were too good that mm -hmm. semester. It was tough all the way through. My next experience was as the president of my fraternity at Georgia Tech. And there were a lot of tasks. The, the most important one for us is the Beta House had been the number one academic fraternity on the campus for a long time. And I wanted to make sure we continued that. And I'd learned from my, from my fruitcake experience. And so we got everybody together and we talked about it. And we got some tutors to come over to the house on, on the evenings to help students who were struggling. And we were able to maintain that because, because we had gotten the other members of the fraternity to commit to that goal. They were willing to work hard for it, and they did that. And so it was burned in my mind then that unless I wanted to sell fruitcake for the rest of my life, I was going to have to be serious about getting the team in the game. My next experience uh, was as an officer in the U.S. Air Force, a different leadership situation. I was a second lieutenant because it was an ROTC commitment. And I was a missile supply officer and I was given an inventory of four and a half million dollars worth of missile supplies. I had very little business experience. I had worked part time all my life, but never in that kind of field. And I was concerned. I went home and told my wife, I said, I've got this huge inventory and if some of it disappears, I may end up in jail. I just want you to be prepared for that. Uh, fortunately, I didn't end up in jail, but it was because the military is a very different kind of structure. It's a command and control structure. The sergeant works for the lieutenant. The lieutenant works for the captain. The captain works for the major, and so forth. And it, it's simplistic in that it pulls together, but that kind of structure really eliminates creativity. 
And so, so I had $350,000 I had not spent on the budget. And I was called to the colonel's office, and I thought, here it comes. I'm going to get the big award. They probably, you know, they'll probably announce me in the newspaper. And he said, what are you doing with $350,000? I said, I saved it. He said, you can't save it. He said, if you save it and don't spend it this year, they'll reduce your budget next year by that same amount. So go find a place to sell, to spend that money. Now, I'm telling you a little bit of what's going wrong in Washington, but that, that was the deal. Well, we were in Orlando, Florida, although most of our survey teams were putting Minuteman and Titan missiles in North and South Dakota and Wyoming and Montana. The only thing I could find in the catalog that would fit was 226 coal weather parkas. Can you imagine buying those for Orlando <laughs> and explaining why they were going into the inventory? So I learned another thing, and that is make sure you understand what the goals are that other people set that you have to comply with. And that was the military was that kind of structure. <coughs> Well, after the military, I spent my time first and predominantly in my career, and then in community activities. Sonny's talked a little bit about talking to you about being a civic leader. And I've mentioned to you that it's very important for the quality of life in our city that we develop civic leaders, and civic leaders from, di from different parts of our community. Not that everybody comes from Tuxedo or from Buckhead, but that, that people come from different parts of our city to commit and to participate in developing leadership goals for our city. So after I had gotten started in my career, it was the early 60s. Once again, the earth was cooling. Uh, and Atlanta was different than a lot of cities. At that point in time, because of the civil rights movement, there were riots and there were fires and there was crime in many cities across the country. Atlanta, fortunately, was different. And it was different because of just a few leaders in the community said, what we're missing is leadership in the community. And just the five or six of us, these are the five guys that decided we needed a, uh, a Major League Baseball team. We didn't even have a stadium. And they signed up for the baseball team, and the stadium was built in less than a year. So they created a program called Leadership Atlanta. This program is similar to that. And I was the second chairman. And the program was to find bright, young, up-and-comers and get them enrolled in the leadership program and the leadership program was more time commitment perhaps than you're spending but it was a day a month for nine months and out of that program came judges and congressmen and policemen and city councilmen in later years because they learned about the problems of the city they learned what problems are dealt with where and they became involved. They became committed to keeping Atlanta to be a great city. And it is that. But in order for Atlanta to be that, it needs an infusion of new leaders, an infusion of young folks that are willing to stand up and say, I'll try, give me a chance. Those opportunities exist all over the city. Sonny can tell you from the Community Foundation, which is an organization that both of I have been in, that both he and I have been involved in, has a, a number of not-for-profit organizations, all the way from homeless to uh, to teenage pregnancy, to food, to decent uh, schools. You know, our schools are a huge need for us in the city of Atlanta. We struggle with schools that we're not particularly proud of. And we want those schools to be better. And there's lots of room. I was involved in starting a charter high school, Tech High School. And we were desperately concerned when we found out the low math capabilities of the students that came to our school. 
we had to do better in math if we couldn't get them to understand the math they couldn't understand and do the science work that we wanted and the reason we started that school is three of us who were involved in the Georgia Public Policy Foundation were approached <coughs> by a number of technology company CEOs, successful companies here in Atlanta, and they said this. They said, while it's true that we're very concerned about the number of students that don't complete their high school program, we're even more concerned about those students who do complete their high school program but then don't have the capability to do the jobs that we have available, good paying jobs. And so these men and women had started to think about the triangle in North Carolina and someplace else. We were going to lose jobs. And so we thought the way to get around that, that and to repair that was to create a model high school. And we were able to do that. That school has since been closed as the Atlanta public school system has been in financial difficulty, but our schools must be across the country, in city and small town, must be improved. The quality of the students have to prepare themselves for a worldwide economy. They have to prepare themselves for a technology world where the education that they're receiving at this point in time, in many cases, are from teachers who have gone to liberal arts schools and who have not themselves been involved in the math and technology that's necessary. So lots of work to do. In my business experience, I was blessed to have two great partners. They were actually money partners. Don't tell anybody. Uh, and over, over some 30 years, we, we, found, we found, acquired, and or started 18 companies. Now, those companies were interesting in that they were very diverse. We had a company that manufactured uh, equipment for the airline and airport industry. Tow tractors, pushback tractors, mobile belt loaders, located in Kennesaw, Georgia a company that was really struggling until we did what we said about finding leaders to make a difference. Thank you. Uh, and now let me tell you something about how we put together our plan because by that time my partners who were a little older than I, that's hard for you to believe, but it was, uh, my partners had been involved in business and we decided we needed to describe the businesses that we wanted to buy. I had spent a couple of years in the consulting business, and I had determined that there were companies, small perhaps, private companies, family-owned companies, that were available to purchase. But the people or the families that owned those companies didn't know how to sell their business. They didn't know how to value their business. And so they were kind of in a block. So we decided we had to have a simple way to explain to them, much like if you've heard the story about the colonel in Kentucky Fried Chicken, when that company was bought, they had a very simple way to determine the value of the store. We had to have something similar like that. So what we said is to the owner of the business, first of all, this is the, what we think is the value, and it's based on its potential for profitability for the next three or five years. And here's how we'll pay you. you. We'll give you a note for a third of that amount. We'll get a third of that amount from the bank. And we'll put up a third of that amount. To the owners, it was a clear way to understand it. They didn't all say yes. But it was a clear way to understand the potential that they had for selling their business. And then we had to know have a way to evaluate the business itself. And so we determined that every business was a three-legged stool. It was marketing, it was finance, and it was product. Those three things. And almost every company that we evaluated, one of those legs was weak. And almost 
every case. If there were two weak legs, go ahead and go. We did. Then we wanted to find a way to fill that, and I'll get to that in the, with a suggestion as how you might think about that as we go down the road. But it worked, and we bought those businesses. Aside from the, uh, the airline equipment business, we own three snack food companies. This is all at different times over 30 years. Now you understand we didn't work 24 hours, but close. Uh, so we had three snack food companies. Uh, we had an eyeglass, a retail eyeglass company. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, and those companies, while not similar to each other, were similar in building the structure. I acted as CEO of each of those businesses because usually we had one coming, <coughs> one being fixed, and one going. So it wasn't all of that at one time, but it was a it was the matter of being able. The most important piece of that whole Megillah was the people piece. When we found a weak leg, we had to find a strong person to fill that leg. And it's important to do that in whatever you're doing. It's me and the and the uh, and the fruitcake business all over again without the helpers without the other folks who are committed is tough to do uh, we the eyeglass business was interesting interesting <coughs> to me I hope it'll be interesting to you uh, in that the way you used to buy eyeglasses is you went to the doctor's office and he gave you a prescription examined your eyes then he would take you out in his lobby by the way, he was, had those offices that had those plastic chairs, you know, where you sit down and zip right out of them. Well, he'd take you out and show you 12 or 15 pair of the ugliest frames you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> you would select one of those, and then he would send them off to a laboratory somewhere, and two or three weeks later, your glasses would come back. We decided people were in a hurry. People wanted service. They wanted fashion, and they wanted to get home in time with their glasses. So we built us. We built a store that, instead of the little office that we had the doctors in, we built a store that had the doctor's office in there. It was a fashion store, brightly colored. Had the doctor. We had lots of frames because. If you walk in and you really can't stand any of those frames, you go someplace else. So we had lots of frames to offer. And then we had a lab in our own, in every store, so that we could make the glasses for you. In about an hour, you'd go home with your brand new eyeglasses. We built that business to 67 stores in the Southeast. It was successful because it was new. It was successful because we had committed our associates. We didn't have any employees. We had all associates. We committed our associates to help us do things a different way, to help us do things the way that the customer wanted to receive the service, and it made a difference. Well, here's a couple of tips that might help you as you think about your possible leadership career. First of all, always have a Rolodex chock full of good people, people who you meet at your church, people you might meet on your football team, people you might meet at the, at the McDonald's down the street, but people who have skills that you might need in the future. You don't have a spot for them right now. You're not hiring anybody right now, but you know that John is a whiz with numbers. And Mary has wonderful style sense. Put them in your Rolodex, because one day down the road, you may need somebody like that. And filling that weak leg it's a critically important thing, but if you're starting with nobody, it takes you a long time. And you want to start with somebody you know. So number one, have a good roll of deck. Number two, keep a notebook. And in that notebook, write down the things you do that work really well and the things you do that don't work so well. I'm going to tell you about one of those. And then thirdly, you need to learn from leaders. Work for them. Work with them. Go to the seminars that they that they put on, and read their books. I brought a couple that I'll suggest to you. This book, 
Lincoln on leadership is the story of Abraham Lincoln. Many of you might have recently seen, seen the movie. He is, I think, the greatest president we ever had. And he had a terrible situation to deal with. A nation torn apart. War. Thousands, thousands were killed in, that, in Maine. And yet, he worked hard to put together a successful program to put the nation back together again. A great man but mostly a great leader. While most presidents would sit in the White House and issue orders, he got his driver and they got in the buggy and they went to the front. And he interviewed his general. He changed generals like a lot of people change socks because he was looking for the general that was going to be successful. It's not a big book, but it's a good one. John Maxwell is a great leading expert in leadership, and he writes a lot of books. This is his latest one. It's called Five Levels of Leadership. Those five levels of leadership that John writes about are fascinating to me. They are, number one, think globally. Even if you're going to put something in Chambly, you've got to know that it's possible that Jacksonville needs one of those. Evaluate your leadership strategy. Write down your strategy. Try it on some people. Try it on family members. Try it on friends. See what they think. It's not always what they say that matters, but at least you get another opinion. Create resources. It's great to have a big plan, but if that big plan is going to take $400,000 and you don't have to have it, you probably ought to try something else. Develop associate trainers, partners, and donors. That's part of that team. Know who's going to do what to help you succeed. And then lastly, train leaders to train leaders, because the best training for leaders come from other leaders who've had the opportunity, who've had the issues to deal with. I, I read a lot of books on leadership, because there are a lot of folks. You know, I mean, if Sonny wrote a book, I'd read it. <laughs> Hopefully it would be in English. <laughs> well, I was going to tell you quickly about uh, one of our programs that even though we had all these details of how to do it that didn't work, and that was our ownership of a professional basketball team. My, uh, one of my partners was a great professional basketball fan, and one day he came in the office and he said, do you like professional basketball? I said, no, no, not really. I mean, I like, I like Georgia Tech basketball. I like college basketball. He said, well, you better find out something quick because you're the chairman of the board of a new professional basketball team. And he had bought this team. It was a new league being formed, the American Basketball Association. There's been some funny books and movies about that. Uh, and so we had a lot of nights booked in the Greensboro, North Carolina Coliseum. And we owned the Carolina Cougars. Now, we had good players. Billy Cunningham, Brown, Jumpin' Joe Caldwell. We had some good players. But we didn't have a team that understood the business of basketball. I didn't know how to market to fans, but we found this out. The people in North Carolina may like basketball, but they don't like basketball played with a red, white, and blue ball. That's what we did. They didn't want basketball played by guys who would never pass the ball, get the ball and shoot. And they didn't like basketball that was played by guys who never played defense, never. They were only looking to get the ball and put it up. So we had a lot of small crowds, small crowds. My partner came up with this great solution. He bought a minor league hockey team. And we found out that if there's one thing that the people in North Carolina like less than professional <laughs> basketball played with a red, white, and blue ball, it is minor league hockey. People would call the Coliseum and say, is there a hockey match tonight? And we'd say, yes. They'd say, what time? We'd say, what time can you be here? Just just let us know, and we'll set it up for you. But, and, and we struggled. I mean, it was awful. We had all these nights that we paid for the Coliseum, and all these ball players that we were paying a lot of money. And then, one of the ladies that was in charge of our ushers said, do you guys realize that these hot dogs 
and kielbasa and ham sandwiches are the best that I've ever eaten any place in the world. And so we agreed. We said, that's true. So we, they looked into the hot dog company. It was there in Greensboro, Curtis Packing. It was a family business, and we bought it. Now, we didn't make enough money out of the hot dog business to cover the loss that we had in hockey and, and basketball, but it, people would actually come to the game to buy the hot dog. Now, we didn't know that. That wasn't anything brilliant on our part. It just turned out that way, but it sure was a saver. A couple of years later, the family came back and said, you guys are doing great. You're making money. We didn't do that. we like to buy our business back. We said, thank you, Lord, and we sold them the business back. We didn't get enough money to break even, but we got enough money to get out of Greensboro, and that was a real blessing. <laughs> so... Sometimes all these things I'm telling you don't work, and when they don't work, you got to look for escape. Don't don't ride into a box canyon. Look the other way. All the, all interesting and experiencing. Now, I, I'll tell you just quickly, and then I'm through. Uh, we spent I spent some time on public company boards, and the primary reason I did that is I wasn't sure if we ought to take our company all private, public or not. I decided not. I was on the Longhorn State Board. Great business. Uh, I was on the Airtran Board. And I was also on the National Service Board. But the complications that government regulations put into private businesses was distracting. If you were to talk to Dan Cathy at Chick-fil-A, I think he would tell you the same thing. There are enough regulations for private companies. But Sarbanes-Oxley, which was the big, heavy rig that came down from the federal government, seeped down into small businesses. And it's a difficult thing to do. You devote a lot of people and a lot of time to dealing with the federal government when you have a public company go public, you commit to those regulations. So I enjoyed that experience, but uh, I decided that we'd be better off doing what we plan to do with our companies. Well, let me just end with this. We need more leadership. That's what's wrong with Washington. The executive branch, no leadership. The legislative branch, no leadership. You can't lead from behind. That's an absolute fiction. You can't do it. If you're leading from behind, your folks in front of you are always looking over their shoulder to see where you are, and that's a bad position to be in no matter who you're fighting. You can't do it. So we need leaders that lead from the front, and those are leaders that have experience. Those are leaders who learn how, who need to know how to lead. And you know what? You may just like it. I like it. Sonny likes it. Leadership is a need in this country, and it's also something that can be a wonderful career for you, whether you do it in the not-for-profit area where you're working with United Way on a volunteer basis, or whether you do it in a company somewhere that you make very successful. So thank you. I'll be glad to answer any questions. <coughs>
my granddaughter decided she wanted to go to Auburn. When she went to Auburn, the tuition was not Hope Scholarship tuition, and her family had to pay a significant amount to do that. The other thing is that uh, a lot of high school students and their families are unaware of scholarships that are available. I know that I chaired the Georgia Tech Foundation, and I know that every year we have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in scholarships that go unclaimed. Now, you got, you got to go down and you've got to dig in and you've got to find out those that are available. If that scholarship is for women six feet tall and redheaded, you'd probably pass. You wouldn't do that. But there are lots of good scholarships available. And there are some good companies that if you go to work for them, they'll provide you with scholarships to go through your college. I know Kennesaw has a number of programs tied in with other companies that help them. So those are three areas I take a look at. Yes? To piggyback on that, um, I think I've had some conversations with some people that seem to think <coughs> with technology and things like YouTube, um, open courseware is becoming more and more popular, especially from very high level schools like Yale and MIT. Do you see a shift in education becoming more available for free? And um, this issue with higher education costs and uh, interest with student loans going away? Well, <laughs> student loans are, are a huge financial drag on our national economy and something's going to have to be done with that. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of not wanting to do it, it's, it's a matter of not being able to do it. Uh, I'm really interested in this program that Tech is just recently in, uh, MIT is in, Stanford, the mock program where they make available courses. I mean, you've got a great physics problem and he teaches two classes a day with 30 students each, he could just as easy teach that class to 2,000 and it could be carried on. I think that'll happen now. The difficulty with that is how, where does the money come from? And so it's not going to be free. I mean, there, there has to be a way to develop it. I served on the technical college board. We have 37 technical colleges in the state of Georgia. We have 100,000 students every day classes online. Their deal is they take the class online, they have to come into the school one day a week, and that's the one day that they pay uh, that they pay their tuition and they take exams. With the technology that we have now and the rapid growth of that technology, 